the final lecture of this course is all about using uh, acyclic partial matchings to simplify the computation of sheaf cohomology the way they were used for persistent homology and ordinary homology. So let's get uh, our notation down. So S is a sheaf on a simplicial complex K. And um, to make life easy as before, we're going to have some notation for entries in the co-boundary operator. So let's write uh, for all simplices uh, alpha and beta. In K, we write um, this expression. So it's going to be S sub alpha beta is uh, this zero or plus minus one number, uh, which is the, the usual simplicial incidence uh, between beta and alpha, uh, scale uh, as a scalar multiple of the restriction map. So uh, we've talked about this before, but let me quickly say um, this right-hand side, this restriction map, doesn't make sense if alpha is not less than or equal to beta, if it's not a face. On the other hand, if it's not a face, then this thing is going to be zero anyway, so it doesn't matter. So this, this thing is well-defined for any pair of simplices alpha and beta, even if uh, this term here is not. Okay, so here is the definition. Um, of what it takes to make an acyclic partial matching uh, compatible with the structure of a sheaf on a simplicial complex. And really, the only piece of insight is um, when you built the weights of pads, um, the, the incidences corresponding to paired cells were in the denominator, which, which was easy to do because they were only plus or minus one, so you could always divide by plus one or minus one. Uh, on the other hand, now our, our entries are... are um, our matrices, uh, the, the entries in our uh, co-boundary operator. So they're going to be block matrices, uh, which means if I want to put something in the denominator, I, it has to be invertible, and then I can replace it with an inverse. So that that is the only sort of guiding light for this definition. Uh, so an acyclic partial matching sigma on K is S compatible, so S being the sheaf, if um, for every pair sigma less than tau in the matching, we have, um, uh, let's instead of we have just say the restriction map um, S sigma less than or equal to tau. We know this exists because sigma must be a co-dimension one phase of tau. This goes from S, the stock over sigma, to the stock over tau, uh, is invertible. So this is just an invertible map of uh, linear spaces. And that is what makes an acyclic partial matching compatible with the structure of a sheaf. And uh, from here, you, um, you, you start turning the crank of, of, um, of, the, of the entire theory. So here's the next definition. So assume that uh, sigma is S compatible. Uh, for every sigma path, let's say rho, sigma 1, tau 1, sigma 2, tau 2, all the way down to uh, M, the, uh, the sheaf weight Right, so we, this used to be assigned a single number plus or minus one, which was its weight, but the S weight, which we'll write as weight sub uh, S of rho, is the linear map. Um, and like all things cohomological, it's going to go back. So it's going to be a map from the stock over the, uh, the last simplex tau m to the stock over the first simplex sigma 1 um, given by. Uh, and the same uh, principle that we had before um, applies, which is every time you see a, a less than, you want to put something in the denominator. Every time you see a greater than, you want to put things in the numerator. So uh, I'm going to pull out a minus 1 to the m here. And now this is going to be a giant composite. And so let's, uh, let's see what this is going to be a composite of. So um, the first thing you want, 
is the ability to get from the stock of tau m to the stock of sigma m. Now there is no restriction map going from tau m to sigma m. There's a restriction map going from sigma m to tau m. And by our assumption of compatibility, this map is invertible. So the only thing I can realistically put here is sigma m tau m, that scale restriction map inverse. And okay, the next thing you see is sigma m tau m minus one. So that's moving us back yet another step. So we the first term moves us from the stock over here to the stock over here. The next term moves us from the stock over here to the stock over the one previous simplex. And so you can keep doing this. And uh, so the so the first thing you will see is um, sigma one tau one inverse composed with sigma two tau one not inverse and so on. Okay, so that's the the sigma weight, uh, and this is like I said written w s rho. Um, and from here on out, everything is. Uh, the same, the reasoning, the structure, um, the, the only two differences are that our weights have been upgraded to linear maps rather than uh, single numbers. And we are doing cohomology, so everything, the, the boundary map is now the co-boundary map and everything is transposed. Um, but if you keep those two things in mind, you will discover the definition of the corresponding Morse complex. So, um, so I'm going to assume in this definition that sigma is s compatible so that these weights make sense remember if they didn't um, uh, if sigma was not s compatible then this formula for the weights would be completely uh, impossible because uh, those things that you'd want to invert are simply not invertible okay so um, let's let's see uh, the morse cochain complex Um, off sigma with coefficients in the sheaf f is, uh, let's write it like this, so there's going to be the cochain group C sigma k and uh, the co-boundary group, uh, the co-boundary maps, which I'm going to write as D S sigma, so that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's okay. Um, so we still have to define these vector spaces and the um, uh, and the Morse boundary map between them. So um, I, I I mean hopefully there are no surprises here. So let's do the vector spaces first and the linear maps next. So the vector spaces are going to be in dimension k. It's going to be the product uh, over certain simplices, let's say um, alpha, of the stock over alpha and what are these um, what are these simplices well they have to be critical ones so uh, critical simplices uh, of dimension k so that's good um, this looks very very similar to everything we've seen before I mean if this was the constant uh, sheaf then we would just have as many um, uh, copies of the ground field as we had critical simplices, and so this does reduce to the um, uh, to the thing we'd expect for the constant uh, sheaf. Anyway, this works for all sheaves, not just the constant one. And now the map um, D K uh, S sigma. Uh, let's express it as a matrix, uh, and so I will tell you uh, it's a block matrix. So I'll tell you what happens in uh, alpha's column and omega's row. So here, um, alpha and omega are going to be critical simplices uh, of dimension k and k plus 1, respectively. Uh, so we have to go from, uh, from the stock of alpha to the stock of omega somehow. Um, and the way to do that is um, is again the same thing as before, um, which is you first take whatever the sheaf would have assigned um, to alpha omega, and again this term will be zero if uh, omega, uh, if alpha is not a face of omega, and then there's the 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 Morse term. 
which is going to be a sum over uh, these paths. So let's see how they work. Alpha bigger than sigma 1, um, smaller than tau 1, etc., all the way up to um, tau m, and then uh, down to omega. So have I got this correct? No, I haven't got this correct because this is going from alpha to omega and I needed something going from omega to alpha. Uh, this is the, the, the trouble with cohomology. So this goes out, that comes here. <clears throat> okay, good. Now we're ready to go from um, the stock over alpha to the stock over omega. So this is going to be um, S alpha tau m composed with the weight with the sheaf coefficients of rho. So, so the first thing, uh, this bit gets you from alpha, the stock over alpha to the stock over tau m. This bit takes you from the stock over tau m all the way down to the stock over sigma 1. And now the last bit is to send you from sigma 1 to uh, omega. So that's here. So that's what it is. Um, and uh, okay, so so this is the, the Morse boundary. And uh, if you think about what's happening here, um, it's exactly like the picture we used when proving the Morse equivalence, where you had um, uh, sigma and tau living in the co-boundary operator. So this is the ordinary co-boundary operator. And it's going to have, um, dear God, uh, sigma over here and, and tau over here. So, so the term that we care about that's invertible is, uh, is here. Sigma tau and um, anything else, the alpha and the omega, are over here. And, of course, the two things you'd want to clear out are um, S sigma omega and s alpha tau so so it's exactly like the picture we had the only difference is a the the boundary matrix has become a co-boundary matrix so the rows and columns have uh, have flipped and the uh, maybe more serious difference is that now each of these entries that i've written is a block matrix it's not just a um it's not just a number but that's that's okay i mean the the thing in um the thing that I've uh, highlighted here is invertible. So, so this block is invertible, and you can use this block to clear out that block and that block, and then you want to keep track of how that changes uh, the entry for this block uh, in the upper left corner, and the formula is exactly um, the, the same, the sum over paths thing that we've proved already for a slightly sim uh, simpler context. So if you put all of this together, Here's the main theorem. Um, let S be a sheaf on a simplicial complex K. And let sigma be an S-compatible acyclic partial matching on K. on k. Then, for every k bigger than 0, <clears throat> there is an isomorphism. So on the one side, you have the sheaf cohomology of k with coefficients in s. And on the right side, you have uh, the cohomology of this uh, Morse cochain complex that we just defined upstairs. Uh, S sigma. So uh, this, you know, fulfills the promise, right? So, so this, uh, uh, these chain groups, so these cochain groups, rather over here, um, consists only of stocks of um, critical simplices, whereas the ones you'd built here are products of the stocks over all the simplices. So it's a drastic reduction. Uh, provided you can find a large S-compatible acyclic partial matching. 
And this is where um, you have to be careful because you're only allowed to pair things when the restriction maps are isomorphisms. Otherwise, we cannot define the weights because, uh, because really, if you want to do the sorts of row and column operations that we need, this block has to be invertible. So, um, so the, the efficiency of this as a, as a tool for making things easy depends on how many uh, restriction maps uh, between co-dimension one simplices in your sheaf are, uh, are invertible. So that's going to sort of dictate the quality of the, of the reduction, how, how good a job you do. Anyway, that's the whole story. Uh, we've seen uh, discrete Morse theory work for homology, for persistence, for sheaves. And uh, with that, our course has come to an end. It was a pleasure um, showing you some of this material. I hope you learned something new and interesting. And uh, hopefully I'll see you around. Cheers.